we are dealing with a very expensive machine. So I'm now looking at the commercial side, and we're now trying to set up in the USA a lab and hopefully the production line. But the cost is very high. And what I'm trying to do is to explain that people will ask me, why can't I do it now? It's not a question we can't do it now. It's the money. As it turned out, Bill Sherwood was the only man in the world that had his number. So, I was pretty lucky. <laughs> and I called the chat up and I said, the professor said, and I said, I'd love to hear about your technology. And instead of brushing me off or putting me off any way, he started telling me. <laughs> he told me quite a bit. And he told me over and over, and I had big conversations with Ruby. Hundreds of hours. And uh, then we had eventually do that. And he actually showed me his magnets and some of his work. Now, it was it's handy, and Morris can come up and give you his version of meeting me and what it's about. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Uh, I'm not a great singer, but I'll uh, admit my experiences with the film, so I uh, uh, became aware of him uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, it's been a learning experience since then. And one thing I learned is that if you want to make something happen, you've got to make it happen, especially when it's asking for assistance. And so I've been doing my part ever since. And it's been a long road and learned a lot. But the good news is that, it is that everything has been progressing to the extent that we are a talking business. And that's how we're going to get this technology out to everybody and that's in the market. It's just that's the way it works these days. Uh, the good news about the SEG is that it's economical. Its construction is uh, ideal for uh, manufacturing, considering it's only cylindrical constructions, multiple layers, and so forth. So it looks promising. And uh, I had to do my part as, uh, in terms of uh, the magnetization, research, and building prototypes. Of course, we can't do it alone, and we'll be looking for skilled individuals, and of course, uh, funding for our site and so forth. Um, but with regards to John, I got to, I, <laughs> I've been able to experience what he calls Martian training. <laughs> so I can tell you, he did not like being at my face. <laughs> it was too cold in winter. There was no hot water, but I trained for my patient to keep the work going. That was priority yeah. before anything else. So I'm afraid he had to keep popping to the hotel to get warm and uh, to get hot water. We could bath in cold water. And uh, he got, it's not suitable to go to Mars yet. It's got a lot more training in it. So here's a man who's uh, sacrificing everything he can and uh, uh, for the sake of this technology. He could make himself comfortable, take care of himself, but instead he's doing all he can to make it possible. And I've seen that, I know that for a fact. He's a man with a mission, and his mission is to help all of you. It, it's not about him anymore, it's about you. And we all gotta get together and do something about it.
That man, we did a lot of other things, we showed a lot of the materials we were working with and other discoveries, and I believe the whole 10 hours, nobody met the building. They were really excited that uh, that we should have done it to confirm that. They also came back to England to cover my Aberdeen show uh, effort. And again, we demonstrated not only the Borges reading project, but the way <coughs> that the scientists have said from 1946 it's impossible to put on a metal. And that's how this worked out for years. You do put that, and I believe we are going to set up for here to show you the way away. Now, the metal there is dangerous to the outer building. Uh, because it locks up all electrical items, like television, computers, everything, and you can't repair it and have to buy a new one. And I would like to see that done. So people are taken in on the left side have to have top security. That is security in that model shop, that if you work in the president's office in Washington, we clearance. That's the sort of people I have to get to work in the magnetic side of the world. I had to be kept separate. In 63, I tried for the pattern. The pattern office wrote to me, well, they actually told me, who was later to be studied it, this is a know-how. Never, never, pattern a know-how. You never do that. And early this year, the English man who had been given funds to help Morris to carry on with the work, Took me to see the paint official of the game because he wanted it patented with the solicitors. And the paint officer seen the demonstration agreed with the good application and applied for it. But, they said, if you want to be rich, quick, that's patented. But everybody owns it. Everybody can make it. The problem is, if you find out who is making and selling it, we bring it to the court. You may find it costs you more than what they give you in compensation. So you have to think of that. But if I understand you right, your interest is the planet under no condition, pattern and no how. Do not pattern it. And my solicitor accepted that and the back accepted it. Never, never pattern this technology because you're always owning that way. I'd like to also say that the last few days before coming here, two people have tried very hard to stop me coming here. One has stated, do not go to the Tesla show, you won't get nothing happen there. You can send the papers over to me and I'll get it done. I'll own it. And he tried and tried. Then we had another company who also tried hard to get me a bit of paper which this would make in the own of this gene and would tell us all what to do. Because he didn't get a yes from me, he went on to Brad Waterman, which of course he got the same result from me. Then he went on to Morris, and he got the same result from Morris, and then he went and had a chief for him to go to Russell to get him to say he only wanted one signature. And he would only, he has already changed the name of the device to his requirements. <laughs> so we've had the struggle that even today they're trying to take it. Mr. Henry Marker came to Miami to be the company, agreed, they think like by 1968 clothing, to they thought we new clothes and know a lot of new clothes. But I came with not the clothes, as I told you. I came for that piece of paper that simply said what they as a firm is going to put in to the project and what they want from me in return. But no, he didn't want that. He did not want what we were asking for. He wanted a piece of paper for me to say that he owned it. He was the boss. It, I did this. I believe that everybody who was here would never have an SUG because they were going to be selling to the very rich. 
and I'm determined that that will not happen. At this session, the Embassy uh, friend here, part of the Middlesex University Bank meeting, decided to check out my statement with Sussex University as to what they were saying. There was two, Gun Sandman and there was Dr. Edwards in the electrical research department of Sussex University. Brad took Edwards on, Martin took Gunnar on. And when they finished, they switched. Now, I don't know if Brad remembers what Edward, Ed, Ed, Dr. Edwards actually said. He's a, a, a man who believes in the world of that city. He's got this, he's had this, that. He never had anything, but he never, he's got nothing out and never will have nothing. And uh, after that, they switched over. Brad went to Thomas Sternberg, and Thomas Sternberg said this. Searle's motor is like a first motor car. Brian Collins' engine is like a Royal Royce. Brian Collins had no car running on And I did go down to Wessex to see a firm who had two Brian Collins engines there. And the manager said to me, I could have been the best Brian Collins engine. He said to me, oh, God is a con man. It won't be film here. Turn the car running down the road. Impossible. It needed a cooling system. As a matter he claims it would do 200 miles of time on anything. Now he said, it was no better than any other engine. Uh, so that was that. I was going to ask for space to do the SUV, but my common stuff was being done there. I didn't want people to compare my work as being my common's work. Now, the other thing too is that we get a lot of people came in the past of our shows, which I gave them once the first Sunday of each month. Now, very famous people, they had to sign in and sign out, and they had to make a comment of what they saw and what they think. We had some very top people in this four very large register. Gary Sandberg did when I went down to the university with two witnesses, admitted to Dr. Edwards that he did see the bombings, he did look at them, and there were very great people who had been to these shows, like government officials, naval officials, people like that. And I believe, and I'm sure, that NASA has been listening to some of the radio programs I've done this year, probably more, now is listening. One has been talking to Brad Ogerman. He's talking to me on the phone, as you will see the full DVD, uh, called Nelson. We know from our website that NASA, very in particular, has been doing a lot of studying on the website. For well, a company of uh, years, years ago to say we wouldn't touch this ink with a barge pot. I spent more time studying the web Perhaps I'd say, then we expect from two hours. I mean, now they're talking to different units of theirs around the different states. That's going on because we can pinpoint exactly where they are coming from. So we know exactly where they are. We know what they're saying or looking at. The other thing, too, is we have what's about 58 universities spend time looking at the website. So that can't be bad. Now, as I said, we will go through a series of explaining of what we have discovered in our time we haven't had funds to work with. And I think uh, if everything is set up, Maurice will explain. I'm going to go through a series of uh, slides and I'll try to explain to you. We're going to go kind of fast, it may, uh, may be a little bit technical, but at least you get a uh, summation of what we're dealing with. And uh, um, we'll start with the... Uh, we'll be able to put what they do onto the screen so everybody see what's going on. Uh, first, we're going to go through this slide. Um, I just want to make it clear that I came here as, uh, as a technical investigator. and. Uh, uh, I'm a graduate of electrical, 
25 years uh, in satellite communications and I, and with IBM or, uh, as, as a rep. And uh, I really began, uh, got involved with John Searle and his team back in 1995. And since then, I've been learning all about it. And, uh, and uh, since then, since uh, two, September of 2007, I decided to go full time on the Searle technology because things did look promising. Um, I'm now a chief engineer for Soil Magnetics, a company that is registered and ready to go into research. Uh, Soil Magnetics will be in the business of magnetization and development of prototypes. Uh, the minimum uh, power up for an SEG is 15 kilowatts. From there, it is scalable up, uh, depending on the mass. It could be megawatts or much more. The SEG uh, consists, as you can see, of three stages. The first one, the green is in the second one, and the third is the last one. And that's what John has found. In order to make it a practical generator, it takes a set of three weights and rollers. And that's the You see that there, like any generator, there are, it does consist of a setter, which is fixed, and that's the reason John calls them place. And the movable part, like any generator, has rollers, which we call rollers. It needs also to make it clear that the soil technology is not the normal type of technology that we're all used to. John calls it uniform technology. Because when you go at the quantum level, you'll find that it is a state of resonance and not random, as in uh, most generators. Uh, conventional generator, uh, when you put a load on it, it will slow down. The SEG speeds up because it's generating electrical power. When there's demand, it gives it. Um, the other difference is it gets colder. With a, the way below it is the colder it gets. The conventional generator will heat up. The SEG has a, uh, it also magnetic bearing, so there is no wear in it, it is noiseless. Uh, typical technology wears in this quite noisy. Uh, well, the next issue is ambient energy. All the energy we need is here, right now. It's just a matter of uh, you want to come here and be useful. The only consequence of that is the temperature drops, which is not a problem. Um, so we're talking about clean energy uh, versus uh, conventional energy, uh, conventional technology, uh, generally degrades the environments or is moving in some kind. Uh, also, the SEG technology is, is a converter. It is not uh, uh, put out more energy into the environment that's already there. No, it's like a solar cell. It takes what's already in the environment and converts it to something useful, or it's your car, or combustion, or, or radioactivity, and triggers things that, will, that normally aren't there. So, uh, of course, it's pollution is another factor. Uh, as the SEG operates, it's bad news for bacteria and viruses because it cleans the air and it's, it's actually fills the refraction of the spreading water as we can discuss. Like after a storm, it's a negative ionization. So it's great for our home, clean air for our time. This is a graphic illustration of the SEG. Uh, you'll notice there's some, uh, a halo wrap. Uh, those are the electron pairs that are being emitted. Because the SEG does interact with the environment. It is not a closed system, it is an open system. And uh, in order to operate, um, you'll see this uh, your operation the ESG will be like a hill or a globe because it's creating a, a, a circuit between the vertebrae into the center for the new dimness. So the SEG consists of three sets of rigs and rollers. Uh, and the, the, the rings and rollers consist of four material layers. Uh, working together, they form a component, sort of like a, um, a dire or a rectifier, which makes electrical power go in one direction. So the first place is 12 rollers, 7, 22, 13, and it's a total of 21, 24 individual components. So you can see with that many parts, uh, you require CNC machinery, uh, a great factory, but as long as you've got everything set up in the uh, 
little bit of fashion uh, assembly line. It's like any other product, just you know, crack it in. Uh, the SG technology is high precision, so much so that in our, in our lab we have to do it ourselves. We can't just farm it out. Uh, the greater the precision, the greater the power output. Now think of it as a tuning fork, the sharper the response. And uh, the other uh, aspect of this technology is uh, you have to take into account density, whereas the industry normally only considers quality. They have what they give you a spec, but that's not enough for this technology. You've got to know the weight, which determines the volume. Um, the SG technology is, is, is mathematical, it's based on that. You can't do something without it. So John uses the the law of squares is a mathematical major, which I'm sure we'll cover later. And it, that's how we design the SG based on those figures. Um, again, the SG is the ambient energy converter. And it really works at the quantum level. And when somebody asks you, well, where does it get energy from? Well, it's quantum kinetics. If you go at the atomic level, you'll, you'll see vibration all kinds of chaos going on. Well, the SEG is able to uh, make that all uniform and directional. And when you do that with electrons, you can uh, an electrical current. Otherwise, it nulls out in the random state. Go the next slide. Uh, here you see a cross section of the SEG, four material layers. Uh, the, the first year is the neodymium. You know, keep in mind, each uh, layer has a function. We all put together the important components. The odinium is a reservoir of electrons. That's where the electrons come from. Uh, once you draw electrons out of the neodymium, it becomes relatively positive. So where does it get to electrons? Well, we may think about the neodymium as what's called electron capture. So it's able to capture from the atmosphere, provide that closed circuit. Uh, the teflon, uh, John learned the hard way that you need a teflon in order to regulate the power output. Otherwise, it's like chlorine and you mix what kind of problems that we have. Uh, the magnetic layer is a very magnetic material. We got to do a lot of research on that and find out what works best. Uh, back in uh, his days, John would use powdered materials uh, worth uh, exploring a um, solid layer of materials, which was promising, but now that will be more economic. Uh, his way was uh, very expensive and probably not economical that way. So uh, this is how we're pursuing it. And the copper layer, uh, we'll, we'll be able to see some of the functions of the copper layer. We we're able to isolate it and determine what role it plays. And it's, uh, it acts as the emitter of the electrical discharges, but it's also eddy currents, which is vital for the function of the SCG. The industry normally tries to get rid of eddy currents like it was a parasite. It's a lesson here. I'm going to slide a little bit of work on it. Uh, next. Uh, so here's our attempt in California. Using the uh, uh, basic sizes of the floor material layers, you can see the Teflon block right there. All that had to be machined, as well as the one with the blue tape that's magnetic. The one with the plastic wrapper, the Indian. Pretty expensive, but uh, I think if we get them in volume, it's still, uh, then you can copper in there. Well, so basic size that we have to be sure to precise specifications to the then the press them the next, please. And you can see um, there were machines that are neodymium. It's a special element, by the way. And if you know about neodymium, the axis of the air will turn into a pink powder quickly. Uh, we have found a solution for that, so we can work on it without uh, without oxidizing this. So that was progress for us. Next slide, please. And here we're working on the uh, magnetic layer, and here we have to use a, a grinding process. Uh, next slide, please. The copper. Uh, and there's the uh, Finished product. A great learning experience for the missing student, by the way. 
first you see a, a, a row of segment. Again, the same series with the same materials. Um, this one segment. And next slide, please. Uh, when they're magnetically uh, impressed, they sort of stack together and I'm forming a roller which consists of eight segments. Next, next. And this is the demo we have here, which isolates what the, the, the copper ring does for us, and it does involve beta currents, and we'll be able to show you some interesting uh, effects of, such as the magnetic bearing, which um, I was not able to do until just last year. It's part of the learning process. The more we research, the more we find out. So it's getting interesting as, as we do more research and more, more studies as we uh, next week. Um, here we're explaining the uh, forces of interactions. Uh, keep in mind there's the, the magnetic layer has a wave pattern, and when, when these things go into motions, the interactions between the top of the roller and the plate. And it makes it pretty uh, complicated. We we'll need the uh, sophisticated software magnetics, the software which is expensive. And we we'll need the good technicians to work on the opposite of the science one. This is uh, well. Also, well, now some individuals who actually try this, uh, where we have a rover and we have nothing touching, and we will also show that there's a magnetic bearing in this design. Um, here is a graphic illustration of the wave patterns that are impressed on the rover in the segments. It's my small lab, I do the best I can with what I have. But imagine if I, if I had a good team, we could move it quickly. Yes. Um, here we start a project in Ghana. Let's see uh, uh, UPS power. It requires an enormous amount of energy, by the way. In fact, as I see a plate, something that uh, John had back in his days when he worked for uh, an electrical company. He had everything he needed, and he was very fortunate. We have to work hard, but what do we have to make this happen here? So, uh, and on the right side, you see a magnetizer, and that's the kind of power we're talking about right there. Uh, next, please. That's another view of the magnetizer. Uh, and here's a, uh, a scan uh, image of the impression on one of the uh, rotor segments. Normally, it would be uniform north south. But not so, not with this technology. When it's impressed with a frequency, it's kind of like it's an AC or DC process. It induces a, uh, an unevenness that if you plot it on the scanner, it will form a wave, which, by the way, I do have a demo for that. Hopefully, I'll be able to show it to you uh, next week. Uh, the best way to understand the energy cycle of the SCG is to uh, Think of it in terms of a hydroelectric dam. So you have a reservoir, and the reservoir is the neodymium, the first layer of the innermost. Uh, the Teflon is, is the, uh, what is the dam is holding back the, the reservoir water there. And then you got the magnetics, and where the generator is. Then the copper is where, uh, where you inject the, the flow of water. Uh, now think of what happens in that the, with the hydroelectric dam. You're taking uh, water from a reservoir, and what comes out is just uh, water again. So what happened? It's all uh, kinetic energy. And it's the same thing with the SCG, except for using the electron itself. The electron is an excellent uh, absorber of energy and emitter. And we use that as an agent to, uh, or is it the, uh, the media for gathering energy. So just like the, uh, the water is discharged, eventually goes back to the ocean, and uh, water evaporates, and then it goes back to the rest of the world. The cycle is complete. And the ZSG does the same thing. Uh, it emits the electrons, it, uh, it took some of its kinetic energy, and it out the atmosphere, it recharges, and it's drawn back to the center. By the time it does, it has gathered up kinetic energy, and, it, and the process repeated. So it's straight energy through that cycle. 
their papers are live in the blogs of uh, conservation. Uh, next. Uh, so here's a, a graphic illustration of what a, a residential 15 kilowatt generator would look like. So solar magnetics will be the company who will do the research. And if you need more information, so we should not know. Thank you, that's all.
go ahead and put that roller adjacent. You start, you'll start to feel it. It's the force is big. It's not big. But once you get it, it starts to stay, doesn't it? Do you feel the force of repulsion? Yes, I do. I feel it repelling. It, it starts to spin the closer I get. Okay. The closer I get, the closer I get, the more it pushes away, actually. Very good, thank you. Okay. Okay. It's hovering about the roller, I mean about the uh, top of the plate. Because there's no friction. The other thing that decides it's a wrong with 
is that if the door is fiddling, as if you could keep curve on there, which I don't think, maybe it should be fallen. Now I think that we should actually have a go to find that as they approach that plate, the roll would really start to spin very fast. And that's a lot of force. Now that roll is not the SUG roller. If the SUG was, you would never be able to hold it. The force would be so great, it would twist your hand. It would literally twist your hand. And so what we showed you now is something simple to prove whether copper will lift a weight and the proof is there for you to see. On the next round, we want to show you, in fact, I'll show you a script for the person to feel the weight of that plate. Feel that first, and then feel the weight of the roller that he or she is going to advance that plate with. So we snap it out of hand and go and sit in this position. Then the next one and the next. So you can see, unfortunately, which you can see on the screen, how they're set up. Now they've all got a precise point because it's a wave. So at the bottom wave, they will be sitting. Twelve precise points. Now this will make a noise, so they're not in an SUV rollers. We're just proving the fact that the rollers will not spin off as the scientists claim they will. We just want to sit. Pass to the second plane, which is already making much more of a 
the death goes in the next place. Go and look at that, that 7,500 volts on that, that second place. That goes on to the third place. That also is making not more energy on itself. By that goes in, you're looking at something like the big pump. Then we have to set that down to your voltage of operation, which is in England 240. In America, I think you've got 110. I don't know if you've got uh, two. We just set that part, we got it down, we get that voltage to, to operate, you see, and of course the current you get is proportional to that voltage. Then there's any other generator on Earth. The only difference between this generator and the common convention generator is that the more current you draw from it, the hotter it gets till it seeds up. On this generator, the more power you take from it, the cooler it becomes. And the problem about the SUV is if you were, which you won't do it here, it's a bit expensive to repair that roof, is that you get down to core power. And the whole structure concept of physics should show that. Instead of gravity pulling, it's pushing. And this is why we have to make sure the electronics attached to the system will not let you it tries to find out how much power you're getting from it, and then find you want to do home. And then say, our machine is faulty. So we've got a big job on that forest to make sure that no one can double share home and send us a bill for a new one. <laughs> That's the, the first thing. Now, so to say that all this stuff, I'm, I think these simple experiments we are doing to find out what does what. And it's quite to identify actually what is happening. While we haven't got the big cash to set up the land in America and the production line, we get there to be moving. There is a another thing to talk about copper, and we're going to use as we show here. The copper we will use in the energy is specially made to our requirements. The rare earth section of the magnetic part is made to our requirement. Now, the thing that's protected this work is that rare earths have a habit to give off two electrons to the atmosphere, which means it transforms into another material, which is the oxide of it. Now, that's been a problem. Nobody has been able to solve how to prevent it. We have. And did you bring it? That old segment of knowledge is shown that there's still no oxidization. So we have cracked the problem that everybody is getting. That's why they haven't been able to make SUV. We can prevent it. We bring Earth, if they're not in constant motion, lose electrons. When in constant motion, they do not lose electrons, but gather electrons. In this room, there's enough energy to power home. You can't use it because nobody knows how to take this in. Can they actually see this? That's the problem everybody gets. Oxidization. Grassy destroyed. This, how, how long is this one? No. And look. There is no oxidization in that segment. That is what a segment looks like. There are eight segments or roller sets. On the first plate, there are 12 roller sets. The beauty, why you look in certain sets, maybe John Thomas can remember what happened when you were at my place and you took the bar and I gave you a solid bar to check and uh, perhaps you tell me what happened. Okay. Yeah, I was very interested in looking at something in the first language. And uh, well, once there's a set of uh, square bars that were about uh, six and a half inches long and about three and a half inch of an inch square. And I set the uh, rollers, which are solid, under this, and tried to indicate this is what we just saw, the rollers stay on the equal space. Well, the equal strains, but they all feel tilted. You could not get them to go uh, perpendicular to the uh, 
really have scored recently. They always, always took their uh, 20 degree uh, shift. And then because it was set. The thing is, uh, the first line I gave you was a single solid. Yeah. Do you recall what happened? Oh, yeah. Like that? Yeah, that one, the single solid was one of the first. Now, when you gave me uh, a woman that had four segments, I did exactly what you said. It was perfectly perpendicular and rolled freely all along. It all stayed on even and went around the edges of the, uh, the square mark. Do we have here a man who came, he had never seen the mature, never had, ever had a rolled set. When we tried the first sample I made in 1946, it twisted and off and stopped. And I said to him, what would you do to solve that problem? And he said, I don't know. You tell me. So I had him in the roller set and I said, try that. And of course, when he released it, it shot up and down. Now what I'd like to ask John here, and I don't know what I'm going to ask him, so i will come a bit of a surprise. Did it shoot off or drop off? And then yeah. what actually happened? No, it was indeed me two, or gave me actually three segments, a segment of rollers. And as I put them out in equal space, and they traveled back and forth until all the forces are equal between them. And the other thing is here, is that here we had some happening here, which scientists say is impossible. Now, when we have the two bars together, and we get three rolls set on, then we see something completely different. Not only when you release them at the end of the bar, they go up, but then they don't come back. What they do is they go over the end and then down this side, and they all keep on doing that. If we reverse the rollers round, we have the same effect at the bar, but now they jump off the end, they come round in a circle to the other end, they go on and do the same and they keep going round and round, jumping off at the end, passing over the free space, back to the other end. Why do they do that? Well, first of all, let me tell you, that bar, if you put bar, you can shake it and the roller will not come off it. So that end is definitely magnetized. I'll pull it off, put the other end, shake it, the roller won't come off. Then why? And that roller got three on, on the bar, why does it jump past that end? Like it just don't make sense. Why does it, when you reverse the bar, or the roller set, jump off the end, come round the circle to the other end? The scientists say it can't be done. The bars, unfortunately, went to Tuscan University. They wanted to check the chemicals in it, because they said that people said that the rare earth was not possible for me to have in 1946. But I can assure you, in 1946, I did get the material from statutory sets of Kilo because only glass manufacturers had it. They had to use it for polishing glass and to tint them purple. So it was available to me. I could buy as many tons as I wanted, I tons of it to get. I was magnetizing the material long before NASA attempted and found you could and issued licenses to General Motors and one other company ever got. Now they've got the license. So now to buy rare earth you have to pay through the nose for every gram you get. But if you want it cheaper you have to pay them a license fee each year because you have the rights to buy it. Now in America if we set up, we became very friendly with some Chinese companies. And in China, they actually make the materials for us to our requirements. And uh, that is very good. Is that true, Will Morris? China has been very good doing everything we've asked them 
to put together the social materials. When it comes to neodymium, we our best source is, is China, and uh, uh, even though it's expensive for a prototype, if we uh, order by the volume, it does become even harder. Okay. Uh, to, uh, to explain that we will continue to use the term Douglas Company, and that uh, the, the fact that they will mix the mixture as we want. Even though they never done it before, they, they wouldn't go and do it. Right. Uh, they were able to uh, create an element of neodymium, or a type of uh, alloy, I should say, uh, with neodymium that allows uh, the, uh, the ferrous oxidation in that way. And that's great progress when it comes to uh, developing prototypes. It comes to work on it before it becomes a problem. China has asked if I would do a Sunday lecture in Beijing. I said, let me get over all these problems first, and then we'll see. In fact, Kuwait wants to, uh, has invited me to the World Energy uh, Conference uh, to speak about the technology. The question is, where on earth would Kuwait want SG? Uh, I find my, for my investigation, Kuwait burns crude oil to produce electricity, and it makes a terrible smell, which I can appreciate. So the SG would get rid of the smell, and it would be clean money, and I don't worry, if it would try to try to Kuwait makes the SG. What I'm interested in is to get the energy technology out there to everyone, regardless. And of course, I want the car, too, to be out there. And again, I'll just hop on the car. A car means that you get in, you switch on, regardless of what the weather is, and off you go, move back to the station, you get bye-bye in the station, you park, and you go where you like, when you like. The time has come when you're fed up with your body, the car is gone rough, so you pull it and dump it, get a new body, stick on, and then you put your car to down to the family and on and on, the same good thing. There's nothing better you can get in any engine I know of that can match that. In the home, I'd like to bring that point out, your wife cooking in that steam scolds her hand wrist, fingers. That's painful, I know. I've had it happen so often. In a room with the SUG, in seconds the pain is gone and all that redness slowly disappears. Why? But the SUG do not put out a positive bit as we are using. It puts out a negative iron bit, which means that that's the room force the floor, it cannot, that cannot work on a negative field. That means all bacteria, viruses coming on, that wonderful pollution of dust and that goes up your nose and you go sick and you can kick the bucket. This gets rid of the kick the bucket, bucket tree and it gets rid of the stuff going into the nerves. So you do not suffer with things like asthma and things of that kind. Also, the heating side is very, very useful part. The reason is that negative ions replace the negative ions to lose from the cells. The blood cannot put that ions back quick enough. So here it takes time for the blood to do it. So the energy assists the blood to heal faster. The other thing too, I look at my face, it comes to nothing wrong. Two years back, you would see one half white and the net, the other half normal colour. The hospital, often I went to the hospital because I was in this explosion. They wanted to keep me in the hospital in the bones unit, but I refused. So they bounced me all up and the children in the street. I was the centre of uh, comedy. And you hear the show, oh, we got a mummy coming down the road because I had two slits to see, a couple of holes to breathe, and a slit to use a straw to suck the food in. Seven days later, 
we had the Sherwood camp from New York on the request of two universities, I think it was two universities, who wanted to check out all this publicity about my work. They wanted to be sure it was real and not a con. And we met him, fully dressed as a mummy at the hotel, which is that in this report. We took it to the site for that, and then he was the person where we went and had the bandages take off to see how bad it was. And the doctors, warned that it would be a horrible sight. And then they had a big surprise. The face had no scar. That's absolutely right, but no scars. But when they took off the neck one, blood shot out, so they had to give me an injection of penicillin and we dressed again. A week later, they took it off, no bleeding, everything was quite good, of course it's white. So I looked at comic. In the winter, the skin went bluey in colour. This did it for a few years, and eventually the sun has tinted the skin. And it's basically almost the same, to most people it looked the same. Only the skin specialists would look at it and say, oh, something's happened to that side of the face. So, you see, the SG has a lot of advantages, which I know of no other machine. It is greater on negative ions output than the normal ionizers you have. And I can assure you the room is absolutely clean. And another thing that you'll find strength, you go to drink water and it doesn't feel the same. It feels cool, it feels like lovely fresh spring water that tastes you cannot get from a tap. It's a beautiful taste. And the two people who I supplied with SUG because the hospital really gave them a short time to live, I suggested that if they had one, it would help to make life better. And the one fellow came back to work, he was a setter on night for me. And he said, Can you let my family sit around it? It's a beautiful feeling. It's great. I said, Yeah, how do you fit the family sit around it? They do them all good. Now, that's what it do. There's a lot of other things that I can talk about that have been tested. And why they refuse to produce it. Far in California, when I was in Reading. Yes, I lived to California. I was in Reading. And they wanted to set up a contract with me to produce the SUG. And they had a chemist there. And when I was explaining everything, the chemist Oh my God, we've been looking at this all these years and never saw that. Then the next thing was that the gentleman sat the mate that helped him to build a factory to do the work and built the uh, press to press it because in the old days we pressed the parts together to do that. He sat him too and said to me, oh, that's more profit for us. There's a man, give him time, build a factory, building machines to do the work. Now he's sacking and they're often wanted. So I thought to myself, you know, this is a risk. Then he did a contract with the solicitor, but the solicitor was going well, uh, I think you call him, um, uh, but it's to your legal people here, attorney. And then, he was just going on his holiday, so he told uh, the chap, uh, Devon Tassin, he'll write the uh, contract up when he gets back. Three weeks later, I got it, and this is what it said. The first one is yours. Everything else is ours. We later went, when are you going to sign that contract? We waiting. I said, what contract? The contract we sent you. I said, that's not a contract. That is a statement of a sick mind. And of course I said, but I would agree. I think John actually rung in when he came on the picture to ask him what was the insulating material he used because I knew I knew it was 
and now I know if I put uh, we call it should many nine which one? Did you talk to people and say, what's it, what, what's the level? What he was using. Now that Nara is very fine powder, which of course is what we need to compress oxygen out of the system when we press it in. So he got the materials in to do it, but I could not accept a culture of such greed and magnitude. But then not at all. Why don't I show you what plays uh, the education not a mark? I'd like to quote back in Mortimer, Berkshire, where I did most of the experiment work. A scientist at Older Master Atomic Work saw the newsreel and saw the car, saw the car in flight, rushed over to say that he wanted to do an interview with me to do an article in the Topic Works magazine to get the people in the area to all fund so much a week that we went to having to go to work so I could work full time on this development. And lo and behold, the very thing I did not want to happen, the television flash said we have an important news with the Air Commodore Bank Britain wished to speak to you. And what he said here was, as we went through last Sunday, we saw the object land and then take off. We turned on the lights and we asked John Sir. When is that coming back down? We like to see it. I said, next Sunday. You're lying. Next Sunday. You're lying. Stay here. I'll see you next Sunday. When I return it to find out what is discovered as it go around the earth, what focus is taken, what the internal measurements were, what sort of pressures happened inside the crowd, what photographs were taken. We'll come back. And he said that we now accept Searle's statement that it will not be back to Sunday until we are leaving. But I'd like to say, in passing, when John Searle comes out in the open and shows this technology, he will be king and master of all aerospace. No one will be able to match it. Now, that was the air corridor of Great Britain. So we don't want to go put that on TV. So it was out there for all to hear. And of course, it went round the world and New Zealand rushed in. Start sending money. Australia sent money. I had a load of money from America. And Stuart Show was tempted to in. And we had over, I think it was a million uh, in the end, from him. And that's why the university wanted to come to see if it really was true what we were doing. The other thing was well, Japan sent in a million, too, from people they kept the money from. Before the news came from older masters by the scientists, the books out there now, all oh, he was proud. Now that you've stopped, they might have helped you, you have to give it to us. Really, I said, funny. I said, you ought to come here and see the amount of checks here, which I now got to go to the bank and, and change for cash to get on with it. I said, stop it. No, you didn't. You see, you'll never stop the truth. And that's how you try to be greedy and vain. When George Nixon, I had asked him to come in because his scientist was coming. And he would say, just ahead of him. He listened to everything he was going to do to help to get the people to put money in some whatever. And then at the last time, and immediately when he was watching the craft going up, he turned to me, put me and said, give it to me. No. Give it to me. No. Then he turned on Red and Dawson and put it, make him give it to me. And he said to him, No. What are you offering him? Oh nothing. But he wants something now. No, but he'll get royalties. Just think of all the people that will be in employment. And the room said to him, no, he needs some money now. So he won't give it to me. No, I said. But I'll write an article that will stop everyone helping him. That you'll have to give it to me. So that's how life went. 
And of course, the British government did know of that what I was doing. So when the meeting went to, to them and asked them if they knew, they said, yes, we are quite aware of what it's doing. From our point of view, we think it's a novelty. We can't really think that a small machine like that would feed, uh, feed the street with electricity. Of course they were. They do use these giant steam turbines, these big units of power producers. They cannot see something as small, just a shade bigger than that, part of your house. But they did admit they knew all about it. There are other points we had in the Navy underwater research work from the USA. He came because he also seen the, the vision on TV and we showed him the work. He went back and he did some drawings for the starship to see what we wanted to plan because I didn't have the tools to do it. And I think you you you've seen Rose well it Rose W R double O S Duckman working for the Navy uh, I think it was in California, uh, a naval base, an uh, underwater research base. Now, he did. Now, why would a scientist sit down and draw technical drawings up for me? Because he knew I didn't have the tools to do it. And said them to me, so I could put them in a newsletter that was very thick for uh, supplementary newsletter number seven. You remember the thick one and the other color. Yeah. That was printed at the Princess and Reading. That cost 500 pounds to print, 500 copies to make available to the public. I couldn't afford that money, and of course, George uh, Nicholson called on me. I, I was surprised because I didn't expect him to go at much. Already healed the SUG. Now, a bit, old man, got to the door. I'm sure that I opened it. He said to him, ah, can I help you in any way? So I told him that the newsletter. Oh, well, I'll drive you down, you take me to the princess, I'll pay for it. And he did, he went there and he said, oh, 500 pounds. So he wrote the check out, gave him it, so they could get that printed to get out. Then he said to me, what equipment do you need? So I told him. He said, do you know where you can get it from? I said, no. Up in the side street there, there's a bone there selling a personal equipment. Okay, let's go. And as you see the videos and on the website, with these recorders, 12 kind of recorders. I said, well, that would be perfect for the research work. So he ordered 10 of them and also to deliver them. Anything else? I said, well, I would need a transmitter. I would prefer the 1144 uh, because I use it in the forces of Norway. I would like the 1155 for the machine because I use it in the forces, so I know their operation. The frequency of the transmitter is ideal. We could use ham operators in the world. So he bought one of that, which you also see in the films and newspaper articles, television articles, and you will see the receiver too. Not only that, after the first display I did the television to watch, the, what we call the forge wall of the post office, happened to see a transmitter and a receiver working, and saw there was no license for such equipment. So they politely came to the door and said that you are using a transmitter and where is your license? I said, well, I don't have a choice because how simply uh, people who all the radio control units are useless for this job and I got to gravity safety in everything I do. So they come in and said, yeah, we should be using that transmitter. But what I do, I see good reason why you need it. You put in the application for a research license and quote the frequency you want to use. And you get the license, you then can use it. So, development of the RGB or the SG is a question 
they cost you a lot of money. Everybody's sucking money from you to give the rights to this and to do that. So that's the third point. The issue of share those days, for every hundred pounds taken, I had to pay a pound to a company house for them to register them as a legal share. And every hundred you get a few thousand, you can imagine how much money is going from the incoming money to the government for the rights to issue that share to you. And you have to do that every year. That's a big one problem. Then you see, you've got the transmitting license you've got to pay for. And every year you have to renew it. But there are just minimum things. You've got your taxes, you've got your, uh, all your costs for the year, your expenditure. So you've got to have a counter, and the counters are rather expensive. But you have to do this every year, but otherwise you're cross off and you no longer can work on the third. John? The John? other thing too that's came up. John? Uh under those demonstrators, why do they work? What makes them work, the demonstrators? It's the way for them. To run roads at the rate we need to produce the sort of electric power you want, we have to uh, really uh, compress all our knowledge into one machine, into the machine. You've got to compress everything you know into that. And the thing that makes it work is that the way the, the waveform has to be worked out, and that is done by the law of the squares. Now, the law of the square is, uh, which I call it a It is a mathematic used last time on record over 5,000 years ago. And of course, the meaning is in well, and that's 5,000 years. How did John Saul know that? That's a good question. Some people say aliens told me, and I can tell you that's, that's not the case. But what we do know from experiments with goldfish, that goldfish do something, it's recorded. And if they come and eat it by another law, they can do precisely what those that they're trying to do. So that record somehow is transferred to that. And what I do is to say, something wiped out that, uh, that particular race of people who use that form of mathematics for everything they did. They are all major incidents, they were always got a few left. But now they can't live where they were living, they moved on. And they just came to another group of people the mathematics was completely different. They never used that system. But they had children. Their children would have their mathematics recorded in their brain. And whatever they did. And through the chains, one after the other, provided the chain never stopped, that data would move through the chain. Many, many mathematics hit the chain. But the trigger needs to bring that all together, they never had. So they played games with different mathematicians called puzzles, which was on squares, working out figures. But in my case, but what has been suggested, we show me the way what we're talking about. And uh, if Morris would set it up and scan a layer, so you can see the label. One of the first things I did try to do uh, research is what John was suggesting is that if you magnetize in a particular way, you will get a waveform, which I never heard of because it involves AC over DC. It's a process that the industry does not use. It's simply magnetization north and south. But with this process, uh, we get variations on a magnetic ring. Uh, so it, it took uh, quite a while for me to develop a, a means and ways to actually start seeing and confirming what Jai's uh, uh, predicted would happen. And uh, what I have here now is a test set. 
that involves a segment that has been impressed with these waveforms, so I was able to verify. And that's really my greatest achievement above all, because it says a lot about the SDG. Um, what we have is an individual segment. This is a platform that allows us to rotate it. We have a gas meter probe over it, sensing the magnetic field, which uh, then we put that signal into the scope. So what you're seeing right now is, is a waveform as the uh, segment is being uh, rotated and scanned. This is a new way of doing things, and uh, something which ceromagnetics will be in the business of uh, doing just that, magnetizing SCG products. So this is wonderful news, the fact that we're able to do this and reproduce it. So if you can imagine those variable fluxes and fields impressed on the rollers and the plate, and the rotation that you got to say complex magnetic interactions. That's why I suggest we use sophisticated magnetic software to uh, evaluate it. So that's the great news about that, John. So what you said was true, and I'm looking forward to confirming more aspects of the technology. At this point, I can only isolate individual aspects of the SCG, and uh, everything that I've done has confirmed uh, what John has been suggesting about the SCG. And that's why I'm in it full time, because I want to see this happen. This is, uh, I'm sure a lot of you would like to see. And uh, perhaps he could explain next uh, about, uh, John, uh, did it fly? Ask him. Did it fly? Of course, it went to the height of the leaf, the cable, 
and hover there, and then she started glowing, and all the radio sets again, good glass. And then to our surprise, the sixty ton cable just separated from the crowd, and away it went. So we saw what actually happened was that the crop had so much energy it could break that cable. So the next time when George had said, make another one. So amazing, we made another one. And this time, the next shop he knew people were looking at, everybody knew he was a very religious man. So I painted rather thought and Jesus but I spelled it wrong, knowing that he would hear people say, look, he can't even spell Jesus right. And he would know they're looking up. So that's the great ground we had. Now we we had here well since the nineteen ten fifteen months. Now I thought, well, that back is not going to break that cable. Sorry, I was wrong. It glowed. Glowed and up came all the great set. And then there was some gunfire. And I had to die for cover. You see, it did break and got away. But there was an airman on holiday on the other block of houses opposite. He had pigeons. And he told the police that I was frightening his pigeons. Well, I suppose the pigeons put more output and normal, and they had a job of cleaning it up, and they didn't like it. <laughs> so he wanted to shoot me. So I told the old boy, old Josh, that I'm afraid they had a shot. And yeah, he said, I, I know they looked up. I said, yeah, I knew they would, but it's all. The words might go on. You would definitely hear them. Who did I want to come? Actually, altogether, he lived to see six girls. And I felt rather sorry because I had taken so much money from it. Just to find out how on earth we were going to control this. And then another man ordered me to leave the property now that George was gone. So I had to find other accommodation. And so work stopped for a while. We moved it back. And then I came into a family in the a uh, white wall uh, well, in Dudley area and he had a beautiful cabinet, radio high five cabinet and I said to him, we let it all don't work. The, the trouble is the clear set costs more to repair than it's worth by a new one. So I said, well, okay, do you mind if I look at it? Oh no. So I took the back off and looked, no bells were lighting. So I looked through the circuit and I saw this odd one. So I took it out, I couldn't find no pieces of it anywhere, so I took it out of the shop and asked uh, if they had a replacement. Oh yes, that's a burrata. And it was, in the old man, it, it was just half a crown. So I went back, I plugged in, and all the bells lit up, and they went the music, and that half a, a pound, you could say, in those days, it cost to get that back working 100 percent. The man was so delighted that he wrote the electric board, the middle's electric board, and asked if they could offer me a job. So I was given an invitation to go to have a chat. And I spoke to the man manager, Mr. Tom. And after discussing it and talking about what they did, their job was to repair all TVs and radios of the area that were too complicated for the local workshops to do with electric pole. So we had a lot of equipment come in with problems. It was, you had to use sweet signal generators, as the oscilloscopes and that, and other means to test to find out what was going to be to it to repair. There was four of us. We were the uh, organisation. Our job was to test everything, every electrical component in the area of the Midlands because they were going to switch to atomic power. And the trouble in the Midlands, like many other parts of England, different parts were running. Some streets had DC, other street, streets had uh, 110 volts, other ODC, others had uh, 300 volts DC. 
Do they want to switch to AC for the atomic output? So we had to go out how this heavy component there that had to be altered. So I had a lot of experts working and changing all of those things that needed changing for the atomic bomb. And it was during that time in which I was talking about the SGDO concept. It wasn't called an SGDO in those days. Uh, and they were all laughing. So Tom came in and he said, Oh, John, everybody here is laughing about what and you are in charge of many areas of research. You can't do that. Now you've got three options. One, pack your bags and go. Two, shut up talking about it. Three, two. So I said to him, well, I like my job, I don't want to give up and go. Two, I can't stop talking. Three, I'll do it. Right, he said, what do you want? Now they had everything needed, they even had a press that could be converted. The only thing they didn't have was the rare earth. And he said to me that the only charge made to me, I'll have to pay for the raw material to rare earth. Anything else I've got that had been no charge. Right, so it arrived. It came from America actually, that Cuba did. 32 cents, that's all I had to pay, converted to English money, and they made it. We had one of the team members who was going to take his PhD in mathematics. He was working on mathematics to get ready for his exam. Agreed to wind the AC, work out the AC coil that we needed uh, for this uh, particular work. He wound them out got the core department to make them, and everything was set. And in the spare time, they converted this machine, this magnetizer that wasn't used, to what I required. And then they were responsible to put everything I said to the test. How many times I went through before the AC core was right, they did it in the end. They said to me, a unit, they were, now, in which you said, in the next one. Why how we met back it? Because they were already committed, they were government, they were com committed to atomic energy, and therefore it was not in the interest. So I had a machine, it proved it would do what I did, but it took, uh, on that job, it took four months to do, because they could only do it in time they had spent. Those were what we call steering magnetic people, they only did the magnetizing of big generators, rotors and things like that, and big build cores. So we had the work done. Now all I had to do was try to find the back end. But the question is, why did it lift? And that was in the, actually in this lab that I was working. I was a couple of cables onto it to take some measurements. And the iron was red hot, okay. but I couldn't solve it, it wouldn't solve it. I felt it was dead cold, and I thought the rain packed out. So I went to the source and got another one and waited for it to heat. And then I tried again, and again, that end was cold. And then it dawned on me, as that iron come close, that was red hot, it was pulling more electrons into that tip, then it was losing by the heat, and therefore the temperature was going down. Now I had the first indication why a material lift. I had no idea about superconductivity, so I wasn't yet aware that what was happening. But I didn't know it was to do with it going extremely cold, and then it lifts. The small unit I did did not take much energy to take from it before it lifted. I thought that by putting a good lump of lead underneath, that would save the problem. Now, let's tell you, scientists say nothing will lift off any surface, because gravity will keep it there. They were wrong. And I was wrong to believe them. 
I thought if we put the sick plate of lead underneath, that's it. Unfortunately, I was wrong. It went to the ceiling. But it did not stop there as before. It went straight through the ceiling. Because the ceiling is stretched for loads above it, not loads underneath it. But it didn't stop there. It continued and went through the roof. Now, the roof was an angle roof. And they are also designed to support the pressure on the outside. That snow, rain and things. So, this weight had no resistance, it just went through it. Hover, and then did the usual thing, chop on. And uh, on my standpoint, it went that way. <laughs> it went that way, or that way, or that way. It went that way. Still no, that broke away. <laughs> and uh, the thing here was that that was the first proof that the energy in the SG is so great. The question now is, it wants to fly, give it a body. And that's how the idea of the chemical. The SG for domestic use had to be laid on side. Because we had to stop. <laughs> structure of the shell is a moss green. In flight, what has happened, as it goes across trees, it becomes underneath like an army camouflage appearance. The question is, why? It ought to be moss green. Then another thing we noticed in the film was as it approached the cloud, the road the outside of the cloud is purple in colour, and grassy moves to a black. That's another thing. Why? So what we did was pass a second car up, which was five foot diameter bigger than the original one, which was a little feet, I think that's my room, P11, or 15, could be 15 feet, P11. And what we did, the airborne went, and we wanted to know what the top looked like. And as we grew up, we had photographs taken of that. It was pretty white. Pretty white. Underneath, it's dark, unless there's some object underneath. So I came to the assumption that underneath the craft is a electron mirror. And it mirrors everything it crosses and projects it down, and you can see. The next thing is, they think that they, because the, the bottom makes a demonstration, if they're not FDG rollers, that's why uh, they, they won't be because they're not intended to. The trouble with this is that, uh, the point I was really thinking of is that with this crop, we have the means to move things and people at speed. The question is that the pilots that came from my advertising on TV, the pilot, Bombs and fight, and this sort of demonstration. No problem. We, we won't fly that. To turn like that and put it over for at any small angle would kill you. The loads would be fantastic. But I do different. You see, Monarch Limited in England supplied this with charge and sensors to put around that met, that recorded the pressures experienced on the structure. And first time when we sent them in, they said the equipment was wrong, they'll have to replace it. So they replaced it with new equipment. This time, the, on the flight, it still said it's at half a G. Now that's how or where it was, what the speed was, it, but, but it was still half a G. In other words, the force you feel acting on you now, it's half that force acting on the body. And now, and that will remain all through space, wherever you go, that will remain, because that force is generated within the whole unit. Now the SG for the IGB sits as near to the rim as possible, because we need it to stay with this. All the districts in NASA and countries down, like Canada, 
and that. And fair, there's a big scrapyard in California, so I'm in full, of all these discs, which simply fair. And uh, because they use conventional thinking, right there at the beginning, I realised that there was going to be this problem of stability. And Russell is going to explain it to you now, what I actually did. He had to push it up quick, he didn't have time here, knocking it up to show you. You had to finish all the flight cells, you didn't have time. Didn't have time to finish the flight cells, uh, ran out of time, ran out of money. Anyway, uh, I'd like to make a couple of acknowledgements. Uh, uh, acknowledge my right hand and companion and uh, basically my assistant who made all this possible. Without her, her name is Linda Hutchings, the IGV would not have been here for all of us to have So thank you, Linda. You're right. You're right. You're right. Totally. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Robot Manufacturing who donated uh, the landing gear, landing struts, uh, retractable landing struts, eight ret retractable landing strut units, which we also did not have time to install, they were going to be radio controlled, but uh, on future man models we will have a lot more exciting things and uh, we are going to have a spaceport, Starport Earth 2, in the farmlands of Chester County, PA, and uh, this, it's going to happen, I can feel it in my, in my very soul. I think the happiest moment of my life was when uh, Fernando Morris called me in October of 2007 and asked me by name to join Team Zero. It's been a dream of mine. I'm also the owner since uh, 1999 of Applied Electro Robotics, www.appliedelectro.com. We make the world's largest B-filled ground effect device, the world's largest and most energy efficient. We help kids win science fairs and uh, basically educate people on force field propulsion, which is what this is. Uh, I don't know if many of you are aware that Einstein did indeed complete his unified field theory for gravitation and electricity, the einheit lichten Feld theory, and it was released with great fanfare to the New York Times, January 12, 1929. So we see in the IGB, the inverse G vehicle, they were called levity discs back in the day. Uh, not many of you are aware of that Warminster, where these devices were flown, the levity discs, now they're called IGVs or inverse G vehicles, became the capital, the UFO capital of Europe in the 1960s and 70s. That was all the activities of the uh, space traffic swallow, the, uh, for, and then at one point it was Lumic Enterprises, where they dropped that name for obvious reasons. Uh, then it was the uh, NSRC, the National Space Research Consortium, then it was the SNSRC, the Soil National Space Research, Research Consortium, to build and fly these things. Now the whole reason for the disk, for the inverse G vehicle, is for control. Without control, the SEG just pours all its energy into the atmosphere or into the vacuum and it overloads. When it overloads, it goes superconductive. The more it overloads, the more load you put on this SEG, the colder and lighter it gets. At 4 Kelvin, the materials comprising the SEG lift with irresistible force. And as Professor Sol said earlier, nothing can hold it down. Now what we have in the SEG is very highly negative, and this is the SEG housing, this wing here, this is the inner SEG housing wall, this is the outer SEG housing wall, and normally it would be a top and bottom, and these struts, the 64 struts, would be open so the runners could run around the stationary place. We didn't have time to do that, for obvious reasons, but future models and, of course, mancraft, there will be. Now, at anywhere from 500,000 volts to a million volts, the craft is in vacuum. It's in its own self created vacuum. No air can come into the craft. It just, just gets pushed away. So for man craft, we have to have a life support system. So in the day, Professor Sorrell, of course, went to NASA. And of course, NASA knows about this technology, has known for a long time. 
I believe, who was the gentleman from NASA? Was that the doctor? I can't remember his name right now. Michael Nelson? There was another gentleman, I can't remember his name right now. But anyway, basically, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, not to point a pun. But anyway, you have to have a life support system because inside the craft, it sits in its own self-generated vacuum. The SCG is putting a very highly negative charge at the rim. There's an electron surplus at the rim, an electron deficit at the hub. Now, what we know from subquantum kinetics, and I highly recommend P.A. Labiolet's book, Subquantum Kinetics, and his newer book, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Technology. From subquantum kinetics, we know that negative charges repel and positive charges attract. Basically, when we have unified field theory, we see that gravity and electricity are united. So, in the craft, you have one-half G onboard gravity. At one point, they wanted to see pilots were so afraid of flying the craft because they would do instant flips and reversals of direction at multi-mach speeds. They wanted to find out. The SRC, the Soil National Space Research Resort, they wanted to find out, well, what is happening on board the craft if you're inside? So, there's a very thin bottle of radioactive material inside the craft, which, if any stress was put on this bottle, it would break. So, they set it up, put the IGB through its paces, brought it back down, and the bottle was intact. So, that proves that when you're inside such a craft, such a field-propelled vehicle, you don't feel anything. All you have is one-half G gravity. So, if you weigh 200 pounds, you only weigh 100 pounds. The only way you would be aware of any motion is by looking at a video monitor. And, of course, there can't be any windows. So, what we have in the craft normally are flight cells. And these flight cells are flight control cells or flight cells. They control the flight angle and direction, and there's also a load cell inside each of these flight cells. The purpose of the load cell is to put the SEG into a superconductive state, and of course, when it goes superconductive at 4 Kelvin, it lifts off, and, and the SEG and anything attached to it will have no inertia. Well, we were taught that everything has inertia, but uh, Dr. Gabriel Lippmann, I believe was his name, made the discovery uh, that objects that are charged have less inertia than objects that are uncharged, and he called it the inertia of static electricity. So we see that a vehicle was charged, and I think uh, they couldn't measure how high the voltage went on the unit. They uh, got scientific, Atlanta Scientific and other equipment. They could not measure. I think the estimated voltage was about 10 to the 12 volts. That's one terabolt. Whatever the voltage is on the craft of the SEG, the current never exceeds 1.5 milliamps. So 10 to the 12 volts is about one terabolt. The voltage is just unbelievable. What comes off the rim also, and of course negative charges repel, is a repulsion field that repels the Earth and anything else. John used to rush models, like P11, 10th of P11. This is about 9 feet. He used to rush models at his house to show that it can't hit the house. As soon as it gets near, the field just pushes it away and just sails away. He also used to rush them at the ground very rapidly. As soon as it got near the ground, it would rise back up. It can't crash. As long as it's energized, it cannot crash. So what we have is the vehicle is repelled by its rim from the earth. Now what we also have is an attraction field at the hub. So oftentimes, when the drive is switched on suddenly, and it used to be, uh, if the field wasn't right, just a uh, DC voltage put on with a small diesel generator and past a certain threshold, it's on its own and running, and it can't be stopped. Uh, the only time it did stop, however, was on a Canadian TV program where the uh, cameraman panned down to the SCG, and it stopped for the first time. And then we had a, a way to control the speed of the SEG and thus the height and altitude of the SEG and the craft. But uh, anyway, the load cell is for the superconductor state that's inside every one of these flight cells. The flight cells have four modes, and normally they're closed like this, zero degrees. They snap open at 90 degrees. Now, at that point, inside the flight cell is a solenoid that fires a hard rubber pin 
at the outer roller, whatever roller is just passing. And when it's in super heavy state, the speed is of the runners is unbelievable. It's phenomenal. So it fires a hard rubber pin, and at that point, the 164th of the circumference of the IGB drops suddenly. Now, if that's maintained, the flight cell is open and locked. You have four flight cell modes, flight cell closed, flight cell open, flight cell closed and locked, flight cell open and locked. If it's left open and locked, the craft will just make a big circle. But if it's closed, it will just fly off in that direction. Now, what we know from the B-Phil Brown effect and uh, T. Townsend Brown, that's the work that I have done for a long time and published in. I uh, also, I should mention that I did uh, experiments uh, about 10, like 12 years ago with two and then later three foot flying saucers of T. Townsend Brown's patent two, 9.9550. We proved with very little power that they would fly and just uh, maintain flight with hardly any uh, current at all and just high voltage. So that translates to very little wattage. Uh, anyway, I've been doing this work for a long time. What I'd like to see, and what all of you would like to see, is not ballistic missiles with explosive propellants, internal combustion, to blow up good people. What we want is something that is low cost, no maintenance. This makes no noise. Instead of heat, there's cold, numbing cold, as Professor Searle said. It goes cryogenic, 4 degrees Kelvin. There's cold, there's silence, there's no fuel. The only moving parts, the only moving parts are the runners. So it has really a huge advantage over conventional rocketry. There are no launch windows. If you want to go to a planet, there's no need to follow curving ballistic trajectories. You just go straight to where you want to go. So basically, if you want to go to Mars and vacation there, maybe only about a month of travel time. The beauty of the, the IGV, the inverse gravity vehicle, is that you can go anywhere on the Earth in 30 minutes or less. So New York to Sydney, 30 minutes, that's no problem. Now, the other thing about it is it's low cost. Yeah, low cost and uh, low time. We now have uh, two, two companies uh, that are registered. One that will handle the uh, the domestic uh, power plant, which is the SEG, as well as the IGV, which is the transfer transportation side is called the Cerro Aerospace Corporation. So uh, we feel this will uh, pave the way uh, for the transportation side and uh, hopefully things will work out. Thank you everybody. You mentioned that when it goes up, it goes straight up. Now that's with respect to the Earth and its gravity. So what if you're way out in space where there's no Earth nearby, and it's going to go, which way is it going to go? Because there is no up. The IGV, right from the beginning, creates its own vacuum. So it's in space before it actually lifts off the ground. When it reaches a given point, a part of super deflector, and the Earth cuts it in the air, Above it, the air, because of the magnetic rotation, the air has started to circle. First compress at the middle and it gradually opens up. This sucks the vehicle up. So the speed of the ground is immensely fast and we have a problem there. That would knock down houses and trees and miles away. So what I solved the problem was to put a lot of energy on the top of the shaft to slow it down, make a big drag, so it goes up gently. We would love to see any aircraft, any spacecraft, go into anywhere in space, take 20 minutes to slide out the air, so we don't disturb anything. Once it's in space, it's in its own world. It will do whatever you want. And what would happen, 
for, as I explained on my website. As a commercial space business, and that's what my interest is, we want speed for economics. So the best I can suggest for this sort of work for commercial is to use a two month, uh, what we call a, a trap position, where at this point, Mars is approaching the meeting instead of us chasing Mars. And two months, it means at those speeds, we can keep in touch, touch with the Earth as, and what we're doing. Rocketry has to get some force on the planet to swing it, so it takes some time to get there. <coughs> That, that's the spot we didn't touch. He's going to be doing Sunday a workshop. We hope you all attend the workshop. He'll be doing that. And the law of the squares is his favorite topic. Uh, the difference between the squares and the standard math, will that satisfy your question? Squares and yeah. standard math. Uh, you want to know what's the difference between the squares and standard math? Well, first of all, the squares is ancient. Very ancient as I stated earlier. The last known time was sort of 5,000 years ago where an Indian tribe used it for all that building work. The difference between that convention match is that we need to know how much density we want and material we want to know, what amount to use. Now, all other mathematics do not tell you that how much of this you've got to use, how much of that you've got to use, impossible. But the square of the laws, I call it, tells you a line in which, if you measure your weights precisely to those figures, this effect is found. Now, I call it the law of squares because it's only one base of a coup that fits the dream further as it's explaining it. And we got the boards of that? No. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me straight how quick I can do it. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we're good at this. We'll do a quick one. Yeah. 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 Now, what we need, it's the green side, which is square four. I don't know. In my hand is standing out there. It's difficult and now it's waving. Now we take a little of that, a little of that, and that makes it easy again. Basically, that's what we're talking about. A square four. Now, if I could do it, it would sell it as fixed. Now, we've got somebody okay, to come up yeah. and put a number in any square, a double bigger number above 16. Who was the. So you can oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. If you care to, to put right. any number over 16 in any, any one of the squares. Right. Can you see? 23 showing in the square. Now, I'm going to explain to you what the law of the square was. This would normally be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 in uniform input. That nothing on Earth in the universe is uniform. It's all random. So what we have to do here is put random things in and get a uniform output. And that is what I got to attempt to do. But that's 23 you've got there. Right, 23. Now in the game show they'd be playing 15 pins so. <laughs> I've seen this many, many times over many, many years. It's really a mind Well, no, that is, no, he is.
it's a mathematical principle. It, we see it as Sudoku. If you're familiar with Sudoku, that's basically what it is. But you got a three by three, four by four. He's calculated out to ten by ten, sixteen by sixteen. One hundred. One hundred by one hundred squares. That's ten thousand squares calculated out out of his mind. And while he's doing that, um, one of the most astounding things, astonishing things, astounding, but, uh, is the volume, the sheer volume of his output. Uh, in the John Searle story, the film, um, what I try to illustrate is the sheer volume uh, books that this man sent to me from the stage this high. I think they're up to 25 or 26. Both sides of the page, type eight font. You know, the eight is, no one uses eight. Everyone hates eight, right? Because it's the legal fine print eight. Both sides in his book, eight font. And solid, both sides. Yeah. And it's, it's the sheer volume. And uh, if anyone asks, yes, I read them. That's why my hair's gray. It wasn't. And while he's doing that, maybe, what was the other outstanding question somebody had over here? Yeah, ask it to me and I'll remember and I'm going to try to have to go back. Say it, they're going to fall down and know what it means. Uh, 
this will knock you out uh, in the old days. They yeah. tested the running uh, SEGs, and there were three. One in his home, uh, one that took the shows, and one that uh, one in his home, one in the show, and uh, one he gave away to George Nicholson. Um, right, that's a good, I've got it all out. I've got to say, I've been at the moment two or three times. Yeah. Normally, I do it quite, quite quick. Uh, you can do that. Oh. Yeah, uh, you know, I have to... That was a good trick number. It took it a little longer than usual. That's good in the game, too. Thank you. I haven't done this for years. Okay, here you go. The, um, the one I'm going to tell you about, which relates to your question is the early days, those three, and they said, okay, how would it behave if we exposed a radioactive isotope to this field, this toroidal situation? And uh, the radioactivity is diminished. I'm sorry? Restable. We should talk to you after, because, good, I'm a filmmaker. Let me finish it there. We want to know what the DNA is of that value against that value. So we, I know that here is 8, 6, 15. So we know that the value between that is 15 less for that square. So if we got 23 and we take 15 away, we say 5 and 10 is 5 and 3 is 8. And therefore, we already use one from there, so that's 18. So that value should be 18. I'm not even what I'm doing. Now, <laughs> now the second move we need to do, really, is to find that value, which should be 19. Then we go up here to find that value, that's 20. This is 21. We come down here, 22 and 23, 24, and that would be 25, 26, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, oh, we missed that one there. No, no, I'll come back to that. 31, 32, 33, the last square gap, 33. In other words, the DNA is the base, number one. What was that? I'll show you the DNA. It's the DNA you need to remember. And then, as long as you know what the value of the DNA for each square, then you can take that value, that square, away from the figure written in and then put that value in there. So you can solve any square Now, the one that I'll do, I'll show you the DNA. This is for all square form. I'll point that out, I'll show you how I do it. But uh, what the DNA adds up to is 30. It's a, oh, I want to explain some more first before I do it. But we're going to do the DNA and every line, every line, vertical, horizontal of the two diagonal must come eat the same number. The four squares in the middle must come to the same number. The four outer squares must come to the same value. Quarter it, every quarter must come to the same value. The four centre ones come to the same value. The same value. The average of 12 squares must come to three times that line value. Simple, isn't it? <laughs> Very simple. But I'll show you the DNA, and you can check it is 30. Let's remove these so you can see the board. Thank you. 
the rituals thing. And he made his, what they call him, but I want to correct that. Those three laws, and I said, I didn't do them. Well, not laws, he never tells us as laws. Well. He tells us as assumption. If A equals C, this B equals F, and C must equal this. And 90% of everything we do, his laws fit perfectly, or his assumptions. It was that the Einstein came along and he did something and it didn't work. So he worked out why. And he brought out his details, which were, became the famous in of the all mathematics. It's the law, the real law of energy and matter. And I like to say, matter and energy are one state. If energy drops, matter will convert automatically to back that up. If matter starts to reduce, the energy will switch automatically. As the electrons are the same as light and magnetism. They are all one of the same thing. Only we are doing it in a different application. That's all that's different about it. Electrons are the purpose that do the real work. They do everything we are. So many of them will now represent millions of them. And we could take all of your night in the next 10 days, and he wouldn't quit. And I'm going to stop that. So thank you all for tonight. John Silver.